when <coughs> the soul first comes up onto an, a human level, it is not um, very aware of its destiny. It still has a lot of its animal tendencies. And it tends to think that life is a very easy and natural thing. And for it, at that time, it really is. Primitive people, a doctor in South Africa told me he used to work in a clinic where many primitive people came to him after fights in a bar room. And a man would have had his stomach slit open and his chest in his hands. And he would say, don't bother giving me anesthesia, I'll just shove it in and sew it up. And they didn't have the same feeling of uh, awareness of this body. The they, 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 their ego wasn't so involved in the body as it becomes as man evolves spiritually. But when he reaches that point of understanding, something that animals don't understand so easily, they know when they suffer that there's a, something's going wrong. But they don't have that very clear feeling that I'm the one who's suffering. And as that happens and we see the light of God is like, it comes from within, it's not like sunlight shining from without. But we use the image of the sun shining on many little pieces of glass, broken glass in the roadside. And each one of us shines with that light, but it's not our light. It's his light that um, is shining through us. And we see this body, and we see these actions, we see these desires, and we think, this is me. And so the beginning, man develops attitudes of possessiveness, of anger, of uh, um, jealousy, all the negative emotions, hatred and so on. Gradually, over a period of time, he begins to understand that his, another person's pain is also his pain. And he begins to feel sympathy for other people. And he wants to see what he can do to help mankind and to help other people. And he becomes more giving. But all of this leads up to the understanding, finally, that if we want to graduate from this plane of existence, if we want to find God, we have to give up this attachment to ego. We have to give up the idea that we are separate from anybody else. And at this point, the Kali Yuga, which we have just come out of a little more than a hundred years ago, could not understand the reality that the ego is something separate from, uh, that it is not anything separate from anyone else. They couldn't see that uh, what hurts you will hurt me. They could experience it if they were deeply spiritual sufficiently. Otherwise they could not. And to try to explain to people in during Kali Yuga that renunciation means also renouncing all sense of ego they, they didn't know how to handle that one, because obviously I'm different from you. Now that we know, for example, that everything is only a manifestation of energy, then it's easier for us to understand that this ego is really only a manifestation of the same basic consciousness that is omnipresent. We are all a part of that omnipresent consciousness. Manifestations of it taking on apparently apparent separation from one another, separateness from one another, but we are not separate. And in this age, it is possible much more clearly to say that I am you, we are the same. Master uses the illustration of a, a stove burning with the gas jets of flame. The gas underneath is the same, but the little jets of flame are all individual. And if you were to put a different chemical powder on each jet, each jet would appear to be different. And so, with our desires, with our, as I've called it, our baggage of self-definitions and so on, our bundle of them that we carry about wherever we go, we, um, it's very difficult for us to understand this. But it's, because, it's possible for us now I remember when I, when I first read that in Master's writings, I had a hard time trying to really understand that, that uh, I mean, I am me, but 
I knew also that I was miserable being me, so I was willing to listen. But when you've reached the romantic stage, well, all the old rules apply. It's not that I'm changing the rules at all, but I am refining them with this new renunciate order for the new age. I'm refining them in that, yes, you have to get rid of um, desires, attachments, all those things, but you don't need to suppress the ego. In fact, you cannot suppress the ego. Uh, you can suppress it at the point where the fire goes out and Okay, but just this gas is still there. You can go on to other lifetimes. But you've got to get rid of this sense of your own self-importance. And this is not, not an easy thing to do. And we all know that it's not easy. I have given many suggestions in my book on Renunciate uh, Order for the New Age to explain how this uh, um, separate feeling is really an absolutely essential thing. It isn't enough to say, I don't want this and that and the other thing. Neti, neti, not this, not that, is not enough. Because there's always this ego from which you can create any other number of things. So the most important thing, and that which was not so easy to attack during Kali Yoga when people couldn't understand these concepts, now it's more easy at least to understand them intellectually. And in this intellectual understanding we have to realize that it's important also at all times to try to feel that the ego is not important. I have seen many arrogant swamis in India and I have seen many wimps among monks and nuns in the West. The two ways that they have had to try to get away from this sense of, of uh, um, individuality. One is to submit yourself to, the, to obedience to a superior. Well, that's okay if your superior knows better than you do. But it's not okay if he's foolish and dumber than you are. And too many times in Catholic monasteries, um, I know I went to Kent school, it was an Anglican school, but they had um, confession there also. And I never went to confession, most of the boys did, I just wouldn't. I go, what's the use of confessing to somebody who doesn't know anything? And uh, I think that the, the attitude of the typical monk, sort of, I'm nothing, I'm no one, that's not going to get you anywhere. You, the, the, it's a strange teaching because the a modern, awareness of the importance of knowing what you can do, self-esteem and so on, they're a true teaching up to a point and then they become false. In fact, I have done a few more things than most people ever get done in their lives, and I have found that the way that I have done it is by letting him do it, not me. And I remember when I was in Hollywood Church many years ago, it was 1955, I think, and Master had told us, let God talk through you. So I thought, in the middle of a lecture, there were a hundred people in front of me, I thought, okay, I'm going to stop lecturing and let him talk. I stood there, and I stood there. Two minutes passed. That's a long time to not talk at all during a lecture. If I were suddenly not to talk for two minutes, I think you'd begin sweating, thinking I had frozen with fear or something. But no, I was perfectly comfortable. I just wanted to wait to hear what God had to say. And I finally understood that he will not talk except if I, Master put it this way, I will reason, I will will, I will act, but guide thou my reason, will, and activity to the right path in everything. We have to ask him to inspire us, but we also have to activate it. And so Master, um, had to have enough ego to keep his one body going. As he says in his poem, Samadhi, I, the cosmic sea, watch the little ego floating in me. There has to be enough sense of I and responsibility for I that you, you uh, can do your duty. I remember walking around the uh, 29 pounds com uh, compound with him one time and he, every now and then he would just sort of stop and almost fall over. I'd have to hold him up. And uh, 
he said, it's so difficult to remember which body I'm supposed to keep moving. I'm in all bodies. But he had to have that much responsibility. So the ego is not in itself a bad thing. But we must understand that it is only a part of a much greater thing. And in this age, it is now possible for us to think of the ego in a more positive way. And I've given many, many little suggestions as a means of helping everyone to use his own experiences. For example, one time I was a, um, there was a big, Paul Samuel, was that his name, Sam? Some, some name like that. He was wanting to start, he felt Paul inspired by, what? Paul Solomon. Paul Solomon, yeah. He was wanting to start a community. And he had invited a number of famous teachers and speakers and so on, and I was one of them. And uh, I was the only one at that conference who had actually started a community. In fact, he failed in starting his. But he wanted to make this grand announcement. I was the only one who had actually succeeded. Well, anyway, I invited some of the uh, speakers and so on to dinner one night. And I was surprised because I'm not on the circuit and I don't walk around teaching and everything publicly, so I'm less known outwardly. And they were all talking to each other and totally ignoring me. And I was thinking, well, I'm the host and I'm paying for this, and how come they're totally ignoring me? But I didn't mind it at all. I thought, this is absolutely marvelous. We, it was wonderful to think that I was so unimportant that they didn't even pay any attention to me. Or I remember one time out uh, at a Zen Buddhist installation of uh, officers or something, and uh, actually it was the installation of Dick Baker, Richard Baker, and uh, I was talking outside afterwards with a young woman and we were chatting and after a while she, I said, what is your name? And she told me, I don't remember. Then she said, well, what's your name? And I told her, Swami Kriyananda. Swami Kriyananda, but, but you're famous. I said, well, maybe, but why this word, but? <laughs> and she said, well, all the other famous people I've met seemed important. <laughs> and uh, I knew she might seem self-important, but I love the idea of not being important. In other words, everything that we can do to eliminate the sense that we're doing it, let God do it through you. I remember one time, Master had always tried to urge me to get rid of the uh, intellect and intellectual sense of uh, arrogance that I had. And I remember one time I was in my chapel, I'd been within a year or two, and I was meditating in my meditation room and I just said, finally, I'm absolutely sick of this ego, get out! And I spoke it with so much power that I think it just sort of cringed <laughs> and left the scene and I've never really felt it since then. And uh, I came out of my meditation that evening and Master was looking over the, over, my, over the city of Los Angeles from Mount Washington tennis courts above them and I knelt for his blessing and he patted me on the head and he said, very good. And then he, one time, he said, <clears throat> the reason I don't want and the reason I've had difficulty with teachers is so many of them begin to get, get a sense of ego. And I said, well, sir, that's why I don't want to teach. And he looked down like that and he said, you will you never fall to your ego. So that's been a blessing that I have been grateful for. But I have known that you have to guard the, guard the castle always. Beware of any little um, snake that can come in. <clears throat> can come in and... Uh, tempt you to think, oh, I did that. Um, I remember saying to Dayamata, well, God is the doer, and uh, Dayamata said, well, if he needs instruments, don't think about that. You will find that if you want to be a true Swami, Naya Swami, the most important thing, yes, you need to get rid of, of uh, attachments, you need to get rid of uh, desires, you need to get rid of ups and downs, and uh, um, all those things emotional problem, but you need to get rid of most of all of the core thing of it, which is the sense of I. And if you give up ice, desire for ice cream, you can find yourself going to chocolate sundaes or <laughs> who knows what. You have to get rid of this capacity for having that desire. 
And this is something that I have found, and I feel very free and right in launching this movement, because through the many years, we've been here now for 40 years as a community, not just here in India, but uh, as communities. And what we have seen is that uh, our leaders are very, very, they're very giving people. And uh, we don't see that same trouble with egotism that you find in almost all communities, monks, ashrams, everything, monasteries, whatever. Um, another thought is that when you give, you're not thinking of taking. And so an attitude to rise above giving, and I remember a senior disciple, a disciple of Master's telling me about somebody else who was supposed to be very handy and asked, well, she doesn't care. Well, it's all right not to care for yourself, but it's not all right not to want to help other people. In giving, you expand your consciousness, and therefore, in this sense of ego, I don't want you to feel that you're sort of becoming so centered in yourself that nothing touches you outside, because this ego is very subtle. I remember I was working hard on overcoming <coughs> humility until one day I woke up to find I was becoming proud of my humility. <laughs> you just can't get rid of this thing. But I have been extremely happy to see the right attitude growing at Ananda. And I think from here we can spread this right attitude. The most important thing, it isn't not caring what happens to you. It's not caring what happens to me, that's the impersonal <coughs> love. I know people have sometimes uh, wondered about personal love and impersonal love. Impersonal loves mean you want nothing for yourself. But in not, not wanting for yourself, you do care for other people. God is impersonal, but He cares for every one of us. He wants our happiness, He wants our <coughs> welfare, He loves us more than we love ourselves. In the right way. But if you give, then you're getting rid of that sense of self. So when anybody looks at you and uh, you feel affected inwardly, either by praise or by insults, or it's a good thing to take insults from people. I remember one time um, Eric Estep came to me and spent one whole hour giving me his opinion of my faults. And I didn't say anything. I just thanked him. But then I went and I wrote that beautiful song, um, When Green Summer Fades and Winter Draw Near, I Live Without Fear, which is one of my favorite songs. But that was my way of working out that really an unpleasant situation where he was telling me there was absolutely no hope for me. And uh, this, this, it's good for us to receive insults. When people insult you, thank them. Because we need constantly to be reminded that we're not important except to the extent that we can manifest God. And so, in this ceremony, I want two things to be clearly understood. One, that the basic thing that we're saying, yes, we need to get rid of all desires and so on, but more than that, get rid of that ego that can have those desires. That's what we need to work on primarily. And secondly, the thing that we can do is by giving of ourselves to others. When you give, you're not taking. When you're not taking, you're expanding your consciousness and uh, including the happiness of other people in yours. So there are two ways of overcoming ego. And uh, these are both included in the vows that we have. First of all, that he is doing everything through me. And the second is the social way of learning to love everybody and give to everybody. Not love them in the sense of wanting anything from them, but think, what can you do to give? Now, why are we taking vows? Why can't we just say, well, okay, I'm this way. No, vows have a very important impact. When you speak a word and speak in truth, it has materializing power. And when you say, I will do so and so, you must adhere to that because there are powers in the universe that will support you. And if you break it, they will not support you. There is a penalty in yourself, not outside, for not following these things. 
But when you do this, it's like it's like a violin string. If you try, if you string a bow over a violin string that is just strung between two points, it won't have any power. But if you have it on a sounding board, it fills a whole auditorium. And so, when we act in harmony with truth, and when we speak the truth and call on that truth to verify what we say. Our words have power, and by the very fact of having said that you will do something, it becomes much easier for you to do it than the mere usual New Year's resolution, which is broken usually by midnight of January 1st. <laughs> so, this is the reason we have these vows. And uh, I feel that it's important now for us to understand, and this is, you've all read my book, and therefore I'm not going to um, go into it today, but it's important that this be understood in an inner way. If you try to leap up from the valley floor to the top of a mountain, you won't do it. It's a directional thing. Therefore, we have to understand, too, that God is very forgiving. And if you fail, but keep trying, He doesn't mind your faults. All He asks of you is that you keep on trying. So when I say that there are penalties, or breaking the vows. Those penalties are internal, but basically, if you keep on trying, God will never let you down. Remember that. Even if um, by the time, by the last moment of death, um, if you have that affirmation, I want you here to take you. So, in reciting these vows, I want you to think very deeply over each one as we say them. Magdalena, devo dire questo, quindi devi mettere il ghi dopo che hai recitato. But each of you in the fire put a little bit of ghi, you'll have quite a few, so don't put them all at once. <coughs> this is the vow of complete renunciation. From now on, I embrace as the only purpose of my life. The search for God. The search for God. D'ora in poi, abbraccio come unico scopo della mia vita. La ricerca di Dio. Ok? Mettete qui un piccolo po'. Let me know when you've all done it. Done? I will never take a partner. Or if I am married, or if I, am married I, will I will look upon my partner as belonging only to Thee, Lord. In any case, I am complete in myself. In any case, I am complete in myself. And in myself will merge all the opposites of duality. And in myself will merge all the opposites of duality. Non prenderò mai un compagno. O se sono sposato. E eh, allora, allora non dico. separate entity, but offer my life unreservedly into thy great ocean of awareness. I no longer exist as a separate entity, but offer myself my life unreservedly, my life unreservedly into thy great ocean of awareness. Into thy great ocean of awareness. Non esisto più come un'entità separata. Non esisto più come un'entità separata. Ma offro la mia vita. Senza riserve, senza riserve, nel tuo grande oceano di consapevolezza. Nel tuo grande oceano di consapevolezza. And this fire is burning up all your ego, all your attachments, everything of karma. 
the whole suit of this room. Ready? I accept nothing as mine. I accept nothing as mine. No one as mine. No one as mine. No talent. No talent. No success. No success. No achievement as my own. No achievement as my own. But everything. But everything is thine alone. Is thine alone. Non accetto nulla come mio. Non accetto nulla come mio. Nessuno come mio. Nessun talento. Nessun talento. Nessun successo. Nessun successo. Nessuna conquista come mia. Nessuna conquista come mia. Ma tutto soltanto come tuo. Ma tutto soltanto come tuo. Ready? No, no. I will feel. I will feel that not only the fruit of my labor, that not only the fruits of my labor, but the labor itself, but the labor itself is only thine. Is only thine. Act through me always, Lord. Act through me always, Lord. To accomplish thy design. To accomplish thy design. Sentirò. Sentirò. Che non solo il frutto del mio lavoro. Ma anche il lavoro stesso è soltanto tuo. Agisci sempre attraverso di me, Signore. E realizzare il tuo disegno. Ready? I am free in thy joy. I am free in thy joy. And will rejoice forever in thy blissful presence. And will rejoice forever in thy blissful presence. Sono libero nella tua gioia. Sono libero nella tua gioia. E gioierò per sempre. E gioierò per sempre. Nella tua beata, la tua beata presenza. Nella tua beata presenza. Help me in my efforts. Help me in my efforts. To achieve perfection in this. To achieve perfection in this. My holy vow. My holy vow. For I have no goal in life. For I have no goal in life. But to know thee. But to know thee. And to serve as thy channel of blessing. And to serve as thy channel of blessing. To all mankind. To all mankind. Aiutami nei miei forzi. Aiutami nei miei forzi. Per raggiungere la perfezione. Per raggiungere la perfezione. In questo mio sacro voto. In questo mio sacro voto. Perché non ho altro scopo nella vita. Perché non ho altro scopo nella vita. Se non conoscere te. Se non conoscere te. E servire come tuo canale. E servire come il tuo canale. Di benedizioni. Di benedizioni. Per tutta l'umanità. Per tutta l'umanità. Oh. Oh. Amen. Now prostrate yourselves full length on the floor. This is a true pronoun. <laughs> 